Children. Great. All right. Then we are good to start once again. Um, please come inside, take a seat, and we can start with the highlight of today, which are the pitches. Before we come to the pitches, um, we would like to introduce today's jury, who are going to evaluate the finalists and their performance here today. So Dr. Philip Veit sadly can't join us today. Uh, he has a personal, personal emergency, but we have Irene Walsh here in the front row with us who's been supporting JSC for such a long time and it's really great to have you here once again. Thank you very much for being here. Then we have Dr. Bjorn Bronger here on the right um, who is coming from the European Investment Bank and um, we also had him here as a workshop speaker yesterday and later on he will also hold a keynote speech. So thanks for joining the jury. Exactly. And next up is Raju Garung. Um, he's a Jakobs alumnus and we're very happy to have you here once again. Um, yeah, very glad he's sitting there. And next up and lastly, we have Helge Husmann. He's coming from our main partner, Stadthaus Bremen, and also has been a long-standing supporter of JSC. We're very glad to have all of you here. And um, yeah, now we'd also like to tell you about the pit stru pitch structure. Exactly. So to give you a brief overview how the pitches will all work, we start, so the first team is going to enter the stage and they will have a five minute pitch and exactly five minutes. Um, we have to be really fair and we have to treat every single team in the same way. So you have five minutes maximum. You will see a timer to your right, so you know how much time you have left. And as soon as you exceed the five minutes, we'll have to cut your microphone because we can't give you more time than to all the other teams. We hope for your understanding. And then we will follow the pitches with uh, the question and answers. And we start with the jury and they can clarify any of the remaining points so they can give their evaluation. And then after that, we also open up the uh, Q&A to the entire audience. So that means the audience here in the room, you can simply raise your hand and then we will have someone from our team come to you with a microphone so that you can speak and everyone in the room will be able to hear you as well as the people online. And the people online, of course, can ask questions as well. So you see it on your right, uh, there is a Q&A tab. So not the chat box, but the Q&A uh, tab. And there you can put your questions, other people can upload the questions and uh, we will read the questions out for you. And then the presenting team on stage can reply to those questions. And that will be 10 minutes in total and then we will repeat the same cycle and the next team will enter the stage. Exactly. And now you're wondering, okay, how are the pitches going to be evaluated? And that is going to be the following. First off, we have the jury evaluation and, and they're going to give scores from one to 10, one being the lowest and 10 being the highest in these different criteria. First off, the overall pitch, then the team dynamic and the team composition, the business idea and value proposition, next off the customer segment and market, the finances, the business model, and lastly, the marketing. And then each jury member gets um, a hypothetical sum of 100,000 euros and they can distribute this among the 10 startups. So how much they would invest into each and every startup. And this is how this is going to be evaluated. And then we also have the audience involved. So that is you guys here in person and also online. After the 10 pitches, you're going to have the chance to choose your favorite pitch. And that is going to be done um, by showing a QR code, which leads you to a survey. And then um, afterwards, we are going to incorporate um, this into the, into the evaluation. So the winning team of the survey gets five bonus points. And now we don't want to talk too long, but. Exactly. Start with the first pitch. Team Squadron, you can enter the stage. We will hand you a mic as well as the clicker. Exactly. Here you go. You can, you can take off your mask just as a reminder for all the rest. If you're not on stage and not drinking or eating, please always wear your mask. Thank you very much. Okay. And now it's your go. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to start the meeting for today. So let's start directly. So how hard is to find a needle in high stack? This is how hard to find a problem in a solar farm. Let's have an idea about the solar farm. A solar farm, imagine it like a big piece of land covered with glass producing, ele producing electricity. Let's have a small example of 50 megawatt solar farm. 
the size of this solar farm, it will be around 140 soccer fields, and it contains around <clears throat> 150,000 solar module. In another expression, it's around the si three times the size of Oktoberfest. We are squadron. We are the next generation of solar farm inspection. Solar industry is suffering from a tremendous challenging in the field of operation and maintenance, and addressing such a challenge is a game changing. Why it's a game changing? If we went back to our example of 50 megawatt solar farm, and there's only 5% the fixed if anomalies that we are not fixed for one year, the power that could be generated from those anomalies are able to power around 2,250 average household for one year. And this is just from only one solar farm. And do you know how many, the number of solar farm only in Germany? 50,000 solar farm. There is many type of electrical <coughs> faults and non-electrical faults in the solar farms. Some of them that we can notice by our eyes and some of them that we cannot notice, so, such like cracking, vegetation, soiling, and could be even stalling. And some of them that the solar model look brand new, but we cannot notice that it's defected and we need to use thermal imaging to look the defects inside those solar panels. And this is the problem that we are facing in the current type of inspection where we need a team of technician to inspect the whole solar farm in a time could reach to one month or even more. And we need to inspect every module individually. And we can notice that this task is very tedious and very susceptible to human error. So what we can do about that, so here Squadron is the game changer for the solar farm inspection. So there's, it should be a video, but it's not a word thing. So <laughs> here's uh, an example of a drone. It should be flying all over the whole strings of solar farm where the drone will flying autonomously while taking, thank you, and while taking visual and thermal imaging for the whole solar farm's module and then will autonomously transfer all, that, all those data to our server where our high tech Algorithm will analyze all those imaging, separate all those type of faults, generate a digital twin, and locate all those type of faults. So what are our key differentiators? Our first one is inspect the whole solar farm in one day instead of one month. There will be no need for drone pilots. Everything will be autonomous. There will be no human error. We are using our AI technology, and the drones will be operated all over that time since we have an automatic charging station for the drones. Talking about the solar energy market, we noticed that the energy market is increasing exponentially in the whole world. Within the, within the five or six years, the solar market will increase from 200 billion to 300 billion market. Talking about financials and return of investments, comparing the squadron type of inspection to other traditional type of inspection, our CAPEX, in terms of CAPEX and OBEX, will be lower than the traditional way of inspection. Not seeing that, OBEX will be increased for the traditional way of inspections all over the time, of course. Talking about scalability, we are able to work anywhere in the world and our solution is applicable everywhere since we since our since there's no need for our physical existence our team has many years of diversified experience in many fields to find the squadron smart solution thank you very much Thank you very much um, for this 
first pitch of the day. And now we will start with the question and answers from the jury. Um, so for the jury, you have roughly around okay uh, five minutes. Um, so yeah, please um, go ahead. Who wants to go first has a question. Hey, go. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the pitch. Um, can you clarify, what is your company? Is it hardware producer? Is it software? Is it service? What is your your core? All of them combined together. <laughs> That's what I can say. We are combining the hardware, which is the drones, I can say, uh, the charging stations. And we are merging uh, multiple type of algorithm that we are that working together. For example, for example, uh, algorithm that controlling the gimbal of the drone that for taking the best frames for the thermal imaging to be inspected later. And another algorithm that when all those data will be inspected and transferred, it will automatically analyze those images and find all those defects. Since every defect has some type of pattern, and we use image processing algorithm to find all those defects depending on the AI technology. And machine learning, of course. All right, so you have to construct drones as well from parts, or? Uh, not really. Like, we can use some of the drones that are available in the market. But the idea that we are combining them with our software, that will make it a smart solution. All right, then you answered my question. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much, Red. OK, Red, you go next. And after that, Irene, please. So I think you've done a good job painting your vision. So what's, what's clear to me is the vision. So let's get a little bit more nitty gritty. So kind of like when you're building the startup, so what is the key target market that you're going to address? It's a huge space. And then secondly, answer please maybe of all the sort of competitors that are out there uh, investigating and doing drone surveillance, let's say in agriculture or farming. So what is there to prevent them from coming coming and sort of taking over your market share the next day because they have the infrastructure in place? Great. Thank you for your questions. Good questions. <laughs> uh, there's competitors in the market, of course, that using drones for inspecting the, whole, the solar farms. But what they are actually doing is in terms of just flying the drones. So they are having a pilot, a drone pilot, certified drone pilot, that they will could go that drive so many distances to go for this solar farm and then flying the drone themselves and then collect those data and then after collecting those data, they transfer them for another company that will analyze those images and then send it back to them and then will be like tab off between to make this money. Thank you. Could you answer also the, the target market that you're going to go for? How, what's, that, let's say you're going into the market yeah. now, so mm -hmm. what's the MVP, like the minimum viable product that, you, that looks, what does it look like and mm -hmm. what's the series of things you're going to do to enter the market? As a beginning, we are going to for the mid-size and high-size solar farms and within, let's say, after succeeding in our applying our solution and having more money to develop a solution that it could be more affordable, we'll go then to the whole market, not just solar farms, and then we can go for rooftops and all type of solar panels in section. All right, I think Irene had the next question. Yeah. Uh, quick question on business model. Um, is this a software as a service solution? How are your clients gonna interact with you via dashboard platform, cloud hosting, yeah. software as a service, or what is the business model behind this? It's a machine learning software, so yeah. where the drone but is... As a, if, if I'm a solar farm yeah. operator, mm -hmm. how will I get the data from you? It will be an inter interactive report where there will be a website, you have your username, you have so your... So it's password. a software as a service, a so-called so SaaS model that you're Exactly, pursuing. because there's an interactive report where you can look at the, your solar farm status, where there will be a digital twin. Digital twin is like two layers of ortho mosaic yeah. and thermal mosaic for showing you that the state of your solar farm and that where the faults are exist and then you can so easily just go for the defects location you can just make does, does any of the algorithm exist yet have you built any of the software do you have it what's the status yeah, of your product development yeah i'm doing them in my master thesis actually okay where are you based Digendorf. The okay. is in Bayern, South Germany. And at the moment most of your team are students still or have you are you already experienced yeah. uh, in jobs yeah uh, like uh, Martin Kaya also, <laughs> she's uh, like responsible about the uh, marketing and uh, business in general, and she's a uh, student who are writing about my master thesis. And uh, yeah, I'm getting my full-time also job. 
well, becoming a resident in Germany, of course. <laughs> so yeah, I will also work in the field of drones and uh, turn, using the transport in the medical field to tra uh, to transfer the fibrillator in the rural area, which is uh, also a new project in Bayern. And uh, also one of our team members, he is a senior manager for a big companies in the field of uh, constructing solar farms, and he constructed over two gigawatt of solar farms in the Middle East and Gulf areas. All right, and now one last question from Adri. Bjorn, please yeah. take your head. Yeah, maybe there's a question with regard to, I mean, you said like basically you need the drones, you need the software, the AI, so it's very intense what you need from asset and software base. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is it not better for the solar farm provider to use some kind of a system saying like, okay, my solar panel normally should produce 100% of the energy, and if I have only 95%, that was your assumption with the 5%, mm -hmm. basically, there's something like an alert because the only thing the drone is telling me, okay, something is wrong and a technician need to go there anyhow because the drone obviously is not re repairing the system, the problem. Yep. So why not having just basically in the solar panel itself mm -hmm. a trigger saying me, okay, I'm not getting 100%. So obviously something needs to be wrong there and I send someone. I mean, for me, it seems to be the cheaper and more solid solution than a mm -hmm. drone because like it might be windy or whatever the drone might have a failure and then somebody needs to come to repair the drone and so on and so on so yeah so like our solution you can notice that our solution is valid all over the year so you can do the inspection the whole time this is point one uh point two for the normal type of inspection they offer you three to four times a year so what will happen within this period for example you do your inspection in june so what will happen after if there is one all time and after one month or two months there will be something like energy bleeding there will be some board that are not used and from, when you look for the solar farm size you can notice how much power that could be produced within one month or two months how much money that they are losing and of course when you comparing this for all over solar farms in germany which we said around 50,000, imagine the environmental impact from all those losses from all those solar farms Okay, thank you very much. Now I would like to carry on with the Q&A from the audience. We do have two and a half minutes left. So, um, yeah, let's see. Do we have any questions online or here in person? Yes, I see a raised hand back there. Lars, could you please um, get the microphone? And then we will hear the question. Um, hello. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about um, also the business model um, regarding the... Yeah part where you said that you want to have software as service. Mm -hmm. um, do you plan to have a monthly subscription, a yearly subscription, one-time payment? How was yeah. that planned? It will be firstly for a, a first-time payment for installing the hardware in the whole solar farm. Since the drones will be there, there will be a charging station with uh, a protection way to protect the drone since also drones somehow relatively costly. So we also mm -hmm. need to protect it. And then there will be an annual subscription for the generated robots and generated digital twin system that shows the whole solar farm efficiency and the whole solar farm situation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Um, do we have a question online, Elias? All right, and um, then one more question. Um, yes, you're already there. Hauke, I, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would just like to know, if, if, is it possible that uh, one of these drones actually goes for more solar farms than just one? Because for me, it, seems kind of um, yeah overextended if uh, one drone covers one solar farm only. So if there are like two farms close by, could it also switch over to the second farm if it's the same provider? If it's yeah, so close to each other, could be, uh, well, reasonable, but mm, let me analyze it. Well, no, since our drones will be having since every customer or every solar farm owner, let's say, having his um, account in our system, so I would say I would separate them, or the data could be complex together, or but we'll consider it. So nice idea. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, our time is up now for the Q and A. Thank you very much for the plentiful questions. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your pitch. That was amazing. Did you get a quarter back? Thank you. And now, the next team that is going to be presenting is Cyberfence. So please, guys, come to the stage. And um, then I'm going to hand you the microphone, the clicker. And then you have five minutes to pitch. 
exactly. If you have already one microphone, here's the second one. And also here's the clicker. This one, you go one side further. Yeah, let me test that. And then let's start. Uh, hello, everyone who's coming to us today. So good afternoon, everyone. So we are, we are CyberFence and we are on the mission to create a safe online environment for all children and teenagers and in the future, all the users around the world. So cyberbullying can happen to anyone. We couldn't imagine it could happen to our, could, could happen to us until our mutual friend tried to commit suicide when one of her impressive photo was leaked. Fortunately, she was safe, but many lives out there are not. Cyberbullying is truly a pandemic. In fact, almost all the children have been treated on the internet at least 70% of the, of, the teen, of the teenager uh, face cyberbullying at least once in their life. And cyberbullying is more serious than we all thought. My friend, she was say, but she suffered for a very long time after that period. And the effect of the cyberbullying will be destructive not only on the victim, but also on the communities. Parents, educators, and enterprise also face uh, social uh, pressure on how to protect their children, their students, and also their users from online, uh, from toxic content, from cyberbullying on the internet. And cyberbullying is a pandemic, and we deeply understand the difficulties and also uh, the shortcoming of uh, current solution uh, on, this, on this matter. Therefore, CyberFence offer a all-in-one solution package uh, that distinguishes us from all other competitors. Our technology can work on multiple platforms. Devices can detect cyberbullying in two-way communications from receiving and sending, and also is familiarized with various formats and also uh, is available in English and Chinese. CyberFence offer 24-7 support for users uh, we offer um, cyberbullying detection, uh, counseling network services, and also post service uh, assistance to all users, regardless of geographical locations or uh, time zones. Our business model is B2B and B2C with three different customer groups, enterprises, schools, and families. So we will mostly collaborate with enterprise like social media, gaming, or messaging app services uh, industries because they have the most spending power and a really large customer base. We also work with schools and families because we believe that everyone should have the right to uh, cyberbullying detection so they can use our technology uh, starting at zero cost with the most necessary uh, protection. And then after that, we will offer a premium service so they can have advanced features as well. So three, uh, we have three channels for three customer groups, enterprises and family and parents again. So we will form long-term partnerships with enterprise as our main goal. And um, also our revenue will come directly from enterprise. For families and schools, we will adopt go-to market strategies uh, such as student ambassador programs, so really large outreach communities. And for families, we adopt uh, advertising campaigns, uh, both offline and online. So we expect the total market size to be uh, roughly $200 billion in 2023, and that will grow exponentially. Uh, so until uh, 10 years later, 2030, the market will be approximately $221 billion. And so with that uh, revenue growth, our user KPIs will also uh, commensurate with that. We expect to have around 31,000 users uh, within that 10 year period. And we, we hope to uh, first uh, pilot our product in, uh, in Asia, like uh, Singapore and the United States, and also uh, expanding to English speaking countries in uh, uh, the next period until 2025. Most of our activities will be marketing, which uh, accounts for 55%, and also research and development, because we believe that uh, our product should work, uh, keep working for machine training and uh, offer the maximum user experience with protection uh, for cyberbullying. 
We have secured partnerships with uh, multiple uh, fields like academia, industries, and government in Singapore and uh, also North America. And we hope to expand the partnerships to European Union because we need uh, a really large capital funding. First off, thank you very much for this pitch. And now we will start with the jury Q&A. Um, and this time, who has the first question? Irene, um, let's hand the word to you. Thank you very much to both of you for presenting. Um, who's in the team? Who are you? Uh, okay, who's, so behind, who's behind Cyberfence? So uh, our team, uh, not limited to those members, but also uh, more members are Who, Who's members. actually in the founding team? Just the first three, uh, so, or the others are advisors? So as you can see, so uh, Rosie uh, and also me are the uh, the co-founder of the Cyberfence. Yeah. And we also have like uh, student members and also like advisor from uh, Singapore, from US, and also from check out uh, competition. So mm -hmm. uh, although our background will a little bit different, but we also share a mission to create a safe online environment mm -hmm. and to protect our user from cyberbullying and toxic content. Yeah. Okay, so you're also saying you're a B2B and a B2C company, uh, yeah. but your first emphasis, your B2B market is the enterprise. So are you going to try and sell this as an API to Facebook and the like, or to social media platforms? What's, what's your plan there? Because that is a big approach and not very segmented. So who's first? Who's the first customer? So, so uh, as our, our, plan, our, our plan right now, so we target to the small enterprise first because we know that they have a limited budget to uh, to build up the uh, system that can be taken. So, so name a typical customer. Who would be your first typical customer? Uh, so like uh, some like a uh, regional game uh, provider uh -huh. or the platform uh, like just specify us uh, just specific in some country, so they are quite small and li with limited budgets. So we target them uh, after first. And they want to provide basically cyber bullying protection for their users. Is that the idea? Uh, yes. So they want to uh, uh, offer the service to the user with the like uh, safety. So they the user will believe in that system. So that's why we offer the service for them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank All right, you. then let's go on to Roger. So you talked about community building and you started talking about how you're gonna approach schools and families in the beginning phases. And yet you project uh, 120K uh, of revenue in this year. Uh, how does that, uh, how, do, how, does, how do you come to that? Um, so we hope to first develop a prototype and so pilot test. Uh, we have partnerships in, uh, as we also mentioned, in Singapore first and uh, test because our founders are in Singapore and the U.S. So we hope to have that pilot test in the U.S. and Singapore first. And so now we develop to English and uh, Chinese speaking countries and we hope to develop to European nations countries to because cyberbullying, as we mentioned, is a serious a global uh, issue. So just we'll first start with local partners and then move on to regional and global partners. Got it. So talk to us maybe a little bit about how you're going to, how you hope to, because so, if, if it's a multi-platform approach that you're going and cyberbullying is happening in a lots of places, as my jury colleague here says, right? right? So it's happening in so many places. So how are you going to tackle this huge space? And I don't really see the value proposition for enterprises uh, as of now, so uh, as we uh, uh, did our like um, research, so uh, for teenagers and children, they uh, they access to almost all the platform on the internet. So, for example, like Facebook, Instagram. But their parents are aware that which the why the content that they access to, and due to the data privacy, the parents uh, also don't want to. Uh, manage or control the, the information that the children assess or read from. So that's why we uh, um, invite, uh, like uh, open up the opportunities for parents to track down the toxic level of the, uh, of the information or of the content that the children, the student that assess to without uh, know that the exact information. Yeah. So would where uh, such things happen, just let's say Facebook, is, yes. that a is that a competitor? Is that a customer? 
Uh, so for sp Facebook, so they just only like detect with some uh, text or uh, image, uh, some simple image. So we want to try to, uh, because like Facebook has a lot of regional company. So for example, like in Singapore, so uh, it's just limited to, to text and simple uh, photos. So I think I believe, and also our team believe that it's, Facebook will be like a potential customer in the future because we can offer like detection not just only for text or photos, but also for audio and for video and other like um, uh, post service for the user, like uh, uh, counselors for like cyber threat assessment. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the time for jury and a is already up. We would first like to ask if there's a question in the jury before um, Bjorn, you can ask your question. So is there a question from the jury, uh, from the audience right now? There is one. Um, so please go ahead and take one exactly at the person and after that you can ask a question again. Okay. Hello. Um, yeah, I get that that you're tackling a very important issue. Um, I'm a passionate gamer, so I would like to ask you because the gaming platform online is huge and like Sony or Microsoft or Nintendo are tackling these issues as well. I was wondering what actually differentiates your company uh, like in protecting from cyberbullying that they are actually attempting to do. So is the gaming industry actually something that could uh, have a future potential for your company as well? Or, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, can you uh, speak again? I yes, really sure. get so the idea. question is more, I was wondering like in sense of gaming, there's also cyberbullying if you play online games, right? So cyberbullying happens where the interaction happens. I was wondering if what, you know, what value do you uh, deliver in this uh, uh, area? Like, have you ever considered of entering into this industry at a certain point as well? Because I see like school, family, but kids do play video games and they're at school and they're at, in the family. So this is a, for me, at least from my understanding, it's a different platform there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you for your question. So I think there are many things to uh, to mention about here. So because uh, we offer cyber fans uh, across the platform, so not just only for gaming industry, because like cyber bullying, not just like uh, send a text or image, but you can like uh, send a video or some like a private uh, file to the other user. So we target to the like um, the game provider, not just only specific game, but the whole game provider. Who like has the feature that allow user to communicate online, so they can impact our system to detect that, and they have right to like uh like uh to um, to not allow the user to continue to use the service if they have like any like illegal um action like uh, to attack others uh user on the internet, and also like uh because like we not just only offer the uh gaming industry, but we also do offer for the school, families, and also individual. So you can use our application to detect the harmful content and to blur the not appropriate, not appropriate content that you don't want to see and don't want to affect your mood. And yeah, uh, as a result, because like uh, teenager, they sometimes cannot control their, uh, their thinking and also con cannot control their, uh, the way of they behave to the others so there might be something that not want to be taken place so that's why yeah uh it's, it's a good choice for them to protect themselves from the like uh, uh the harmful content on the internet yeah all right thank you very much um our jury has one more question we have one uh, unfortunately we only have time for one more question so bian please make it quick um I we know you have quick, more yeah. questions if but... you go could you go back one slide go back yeah um, you were saying like basically it's a single market platform, but you, what you were addressing there mainly is actually one platform. I mean, you're saying like basically Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, they all belong to Meta. So they are actually more or less one group. So, I mean, if that would be really the solution to stop basically cyberbullying, I mean, they have the resources to implement it themselves and they would have it one system solution while you are offering it and maybe your software is working, but they would need to implement a third party software which I believe Facebook would be very reluctant to do so. So how does it be implemented? How does it work? What is the selling point to them? 30 uh, seconds left. 
Uh, so okay, because like uh, depend on the uh um the way that they use. For example, like because like we also have the uh plugin, you know, the add-ons for the web browser. But uh, those uh um those uh, platform doesn't uh, uh doesn't uh like support that. And because like cyberbullying can take a take can take a place in like any ways. For example, like uh through emails. Or to another like social media, not just li limited to this okay, platform. Okay, please come to an end. Uh, so that's why uh, I think uh, Cyberfence will like uh, will be outstanding from the the other competitors. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, if you have two more questions, um, please feel free to ask the teams in the networking time after our pitches. Thank you very much. A big applause for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you hand the second one back to our team? And now we will continue with our third pitch. <laughs> oh, which is going to be Neural Affinity. Yannick, take it ahead. Um, and yeah, Morning. your timer Morning. starts Morning, now. JSC. My name is Yannick, and yeah, I'm the founder of Neural Affinity. Neural Affinity provides AI models to software developers through tooling that they already know. So. The main product here is called Computational Magic. It's a cloud platform. Basically, imagine it as AI as a service. Um, long term, it's going to have many, many different models. But the easiest way to actually show you how this works and what it does is if we discuss three of our beta customers. Yes, it's already in beta. And the first one is a legal tech startup. And they actually uh, required a model in order to summarize complex legal documents chapter by chapter. But they're a very small company. Um, just the founders team and they didn't have the resources, they didn't, they didn't have the data, they didn't have the compute power and especially not the AI expertise to build their own models. But with New Affinity solution, they could really just needed a couple lines of code and a credit card to get started. And because the models are built to be generalizable and to be cross domain, the same model can also be used by many other customers. For example, an e-commerce shop who is trying to summarize product descriptions for the mobile app to have sort of shorter mobile descriptions and uh, a news aggregator who didn't want to use the clickbaity short summaries that you see on top of news articles and instead rather have a true summary of the article. That's basically what it does. And the industries for this are very broad. So we're targeting software developers, particularly the smaller development houses with low resources. There's currently an estimated 27.7 million software developers in the world. Many of them in the last couple of years will have some form of app where they will need to incorporate AI functionality. So this is going to be a big market. It's currently valued by some analysts at $190 billion. And yeah, we're tackling anything from web agencies, medical tech, legal tech, education, uh, mainly because uh, really the uh, stuff can completely be uh, cross domain. It's not domain specific. And why can New Affinity do this? Because it's really the aggregation of 10 years of AI experience going back to the start of the current AI wave, really. Um, at the same time, I personally have previously founded startups. I failed also, so I learned a lot, but I already know what it means and what it takes to build a high-performing team. I know what it takes to execute a business strategy, so I'm not completely new to this. And if you look at why New Affinity will succeed with this, well, if you look at the traditional uh, approach, some of you know it. You build AI models. I know some other people here in the competition really... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize I wasn't speaking in the mic. Um, so, yeah, it's many steps involved in order to build a model. Uh, and it's very expensive. You will take months. You need data. You need computing power. And you need expertise that basically sometimes you can't even get on the market right now if you want to hire someone for it. With computational magic, you define your problem. You select an appropriate model. And off you go. You can call the API from your app's code base in a matter of hours. And really, this is how easy it is. That's an example in Python. It's five lines of code. You can use any programming language, of course, as long as you can make web requests. But it's that simple. And this really means you can go from months to hours to build AI enabled apps. So really big revolution for all the small guys there. Of course, we're not the only ones working on this. There's competition. There are the big cloud providers who are trying to break into the space, but they're using previous generation technology. So often customers still need to have some form of domain specific data set. They're not transferable. Other companies are trying to go the general route, but they don't want to provide a broad range of models. They're just providing very few models or maybe even just one. And so the skills that you acquire if you work with them wouldn't transfer to your next project. With New Affinity, we have ease of use. And at the same time, we also strive to provide a large model category long term. 
Um, and at the same time, yeah, the big unfair advantage, the underlying magic compared to the competition is really the customer time to market, which even compared to the likes of AWS will be reduced. And at the same time, the superior developer experience. And this is already in beta right now. You can go out right now to Rapid API, sign up. This is the pricing model. We're achieving around a 37, uh, sorry, 79 percent uh, 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 margin on that at the moment with this pricing model. And uh, yeah, we're meeting our customers where they are um, on Reddit, on Stack Overflow, on Twitter, where they find new technologies. So DevRel is really the way to reach out and go to market here. And this is the timeline. As I said, limited beta is already done. Public beta releases out there right now. You can go right now, buy it. And uh, the next target is to validate the market completely with the 3,200 MRR target. And for that, I would need about $75,000 in funding to yeah, finish and accelerate the growth to really validate the market completely. Thank you. Thank you very much for this pitch. Um, and yeah, now we'll um, once again come to the question and answers. And uh, yeah, this time, Roger. All right. Um, Helga, do you want to go ahead this time? Thanks, Yannick. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for the great pitch. Um, what is, um, I know you're really a, a, a programming guy, let me put it this way, um, but then you have to enter a market. Um, can you give me some insights about your team yet or and, and your team maybe in six or 12 months? So uh, is this question really about the team or about entering the market? Um, entering the market and uh, driving maybe capacity. Yeah. capacity. So the big thing really is, I don't know if you guys know, but software developers really hate being advertised to. They hate getting phone calls. So the main thing here is developer relations. And part of the funding would really build out that function within the company and hire someone who's really, really well versed in DevRel to get that kick started. And already recently, yeah, she's here right now, Julia is starting to help me a little bit on marketing as well. So that's already happening. All right, then Roger, carry on, please. So, as I understand, for now, it's uh, you are the sole uh, founder in the team, and then you've got some ad hoc marketing support. So that's yeah, I'm the that's sole founder. I okay. also have support on the tech side as well, um, but I would consider myself sole founder. Yes, great, great that you are the customer yourself. So now, just talk us through a little bit about the because you, uh, from what I understand, you're approaching as we see more modular software development. You're kind of uh, embedding modularity in AI development, right? So how would this uh, public beta release, how would that look like and who would be your first clients? Um, the first clients are already there as well. Um, so for example, as I talked about, there's that uh, legal tech app, they're making an app for lawyers and those lawyers don't have much time. They still want to review contact contracts quickly so they can just speed it up, find stuff they don't like with a summary that's sort of one use case. And uh, there's a platform where a lot of different API providers can go rapid API. And we kind of use that as the launch vehicle, let's say, before we have all the resources and capacity to build our own portal. So really, we had to the opportunity to focus on operationalizing, running the models in production, making sure they run, run smoothly and don't have to focus that much on uh, all the credit card sign up stuff and so on. Got it. So maybe a quick idea on, do you have any idea on the market size here? Yeah, um, so we estimate that by 2030, the obtainable market is around $24 million, um, but the total market size, so I think Markets and Markets was the analyst that provided the $190 billion number. It's growing around 48.7% uh, per year, so it really accelerates quickly, and uh, it's also a very big market generally, especially AI will be everywhere, as you all know. Okay, Irene, we have around two minutes left, just saying that for the direct Q&A. Okay, you have a very broad customer base. You do have some use cases, you do have some first customers, but it's very, very broad. You said the buying customer, you are targeting software developers, but within the legal tech company, for for example, that is not your buying customer. That's not... No, that is the, buy, the, the customer is the app developer that makes the app for the lawyers. Right, okay, so, so your buying customer, the one that pays the money, is this the developer community, not the corporate behind it, not the company behind it. 
but of course they multiply. So if my customers are successful, mm -hmm. building successful apps, having a lot of customers themselves, then also they generate more requests. The business model is per request. So the more they grow, the more my business grows. It's just a very finicky market. You said yourself, there's 7 million or so software developers all over the world. So isn't it better to target the corporate customers behind it? Um, actually, uh, the easiest way to adopt technologies into large corporates is actually through the developers because they're the, usually the ones who find interesting stuff, start using it in their personal projects, and then go to their bosses and say, I found this, this works amazing, I want to use this in production. That's how stuff like Vue got huge, with like 50 million downloads on GitHub. I don't get understand your business model. Rapid API, what does that mean? I know software as a service, but does that mean, is that like a, a connection off the No, it's off basically the an API marketplace. So there's mostly data APIs on there. But uh, we figured it's a great way because they already have the payment infrastructure in place. They have a discovery function in place. So that was an easy way to get early customers. So you don't quickly. train the software. You do an AI software, but you skip the whole, all the steps to do with training the software. No, we are, we are training uh, the own AI, that's our internal AI models. Yeah. Uh, it's just really the front end uh, of where you put in your credit card details that is uh, provided through a partner portal. For the moment, there will be uh, our own portal for that too. Oh, that's not ready yet. So very techy product that might need some more explanation so that everybody can understand. Okay, but thank you very much. All right, um, time is up. But um, Björn, um, do you want to take it ahead? Do you have a question? Yeah, actually, my question was going in a similar direction uh, because of the market segment. Um, because when I remember, the margin was very small. 79% uh, is the contribution margin on the current pricing. And that can still, like if NVIDIA launches new GPUs, that will basically cut my cost in half, minimum. Okay. And you were earlier speaking that you need uh, roughly 75K fundings. Yeah, that's to build out infrastructure and to really kickstart the growth by making more marketing efforts and especially getting somebody at least part-time for DevRel. Okay. And who are you targeting with this? Assuming I will give you now 75K, who are you targeting with this? In terms of customers, yes. in terms of hiring, uh, customers, customers would be uh, particularly the smaller um, development houses. So anything like your typical app development agencies, sort of the app store developers, that kind of people. All right, then so that's one to five developers usually. Okay, we have around four minutes left. So um, let's hear from the audience. Is there a question from someone who, um, yeah, who uh, would like to know something from Yannick? All right, back there, please. Is that Parth? It is Parth. Hi. So how are you skipping the domain-specific knowledge that is needed to create these models? Because as a developer, I see that, OK, yeah, there's millions of lines of log that I can probably parse through manually, or I could write a model for it. But oftentimes, a lot of that is gibberish, and I don't look through it. But that is also very domain-specific. And how, when you're providing these models, uh, well, yeah, skip this domain data extraction and fit it to the customer. So the first big word there, in case you know what that means, is transformer models. Mm -hmm. um, that already makes it a lot easier to build generalizable models. Then the second thing is, of course, perfect data sets that are built specifically for that and other automation to help build those data sets very quickly and very efficiently. Uh, and then the third thing is using large data sets and lots and lots and lots of compute. Basically, uh, yeah, I'm currently going broke on basically paying for compute power to train models, yes, <laughs> personally. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a question online. Exactly. So, um, yes, just a kind reminder for the audience online, there's always the possibility to put questions into the Q&A function. And we have one by Anthony, who's saying cool stuff. Would AI anomalies be more of an issue with internal models? Uh, I'm not sure what they mean by internal models. When I said internal model, I meant that they're developed in-house at New Affinity. Um, really, it's only as good as what you put in. So the training data is the big thing. And that's also where I see a big of technological advantage just by the types of data sets that uh, New Affinity has access to and has curated over, and not just the existence of the company. Actually, even before that, I started collecting some of that stuff. All right. Um, we hope that answers your question. If not, um, please put a follow-up question in the Q&A box. Um, we do have around one um, minute 50 left. <laughs> Indeed, ah. there is a comment to the question. Anthony says, meaning that AI failures would stay unrecognized longer, would cost more to fix, etc. 
Um, how do I answer that ideally? Um, well, of course the models are tested. There's testing suites to go through and there's uh, specific things that are tested for such as bias uh, to make sure that that doesn't occur. Um, and especially because they're so broad and generalizable. Uh, and I also should mention actually a lot of those problems are often for uh, structured data AI issues. However, we're mostly dealing, well, mostly we're exclusively dealing with unstructured data such as written text, spoken text, video, uh, and uh, also image data. All right. So that's less of a common problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have another, I think we have another question from the audience right back there. Yeah. Or for everyone, okay. Okay, so how you take care of transparency and uh, explainability of AI? Like if you generalize or encapsulate all the things inside a black box, it won't be that transparent or explainable. So a person working on it might might not know what's going inside. And if, not, if a person not know what's going inside, he might not be able to correct the issues uh, that may occur uh, after building that model. Thank you. Um, that's actually a question that's hard to answer in 12 seconds, but model lifecycle management is a huge part of operating AI models in production. I'm aware of that, and of course it's taken care of. All right. A big applause again. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> that was truly an insightful pitch. And, and now we want to come to our fourth pitch, which is going to be done by ClipClub. Okay, they need to set up real quick here is the microphone and here's the clicker you can use that one exactly do you need two microphones or do you want one two okay then please hit the next one two okay and with this your five minutes start now hey Vero, what are you doing there i'm going for a bike ride but why are you wearing this weird click shoes yeah, well, they're to click myself in. But you don't know ClipClip? No, what's that? ClipClip is an innovative adapter which you can just uh, attach on your shoes. And how does it work? You can just open it, put it on your shoe. So easy. Attach it, fix it, and then you can go on your bike and cycle wherever you want. Wow, cool. <laughs> <laughs> In a similar situation, Vero and me met last year, and since then we are developing ClipClap. So as I mentioned, ClipClap is an innovative adapter which is not existing on the market yet, which connects your shoe to the pedal of your bike. So there are two different options. You have an um, option for mountain bike and trekking bike, as well as an option for road bikes. This is a different pedal system, but we can use all uh, existing pedal system with these two options. We also um, have a big, yeah, we, we are thinking sustainability is, a, um, is really important. So due to that, we are reusing old cycling tubes as a slipping stopper for your shoe. And it's also like a protection for your shoe. The materials we use are sustainable and recyclable. And uh, this is now the pre 3D printed prototype, but we go in, into reproduction end of uh, start of next year. And we all, uh, already have patent pending since last year. To prove the durability and also the function, I did a long bike trip last year from Germany to Portugal, over 3,500 kilometers, where I tested the first prototypes, where you can see in the, in the picture on the bottom left, it worked out really great, but we had some improvements, and now the new prototypes looks a little bit different. And at the moment, I'm on the way back from Spain to, uh, from Portugal to Cologne, and I make a stop in Spain just for this competition here, and I continue on Monday to test the new prototypes again. Obviously, before we did all this prototyping and development, we did also a great um, a deep marketing research in which luckily for us, we, we discovered that there's no um, available option at the moment. There's cages and straps which are dangerous and uncomfortable, or there's these shoes or sandals that are expensive and obviously, as you can see, they're very ugly. And also, our market is big. Alone in Germany, there's more than 13 million active cyclists. And uh, if we manage to get at least 2.5% of that as potential buyers, we would have a turnover of 22 million euros in revenue with a um, selling price of 68 euros. 
obviously in Europe and North America, the market is even bigger. So we're speaking about millions of euros. Then we're also by, how are we going to make it there? So we're building a strong community. It's growing slow. Alone in Instagram, we also have, we have more than 500 followers. We also have in LinkedIn more than 100 followers. And we already have a database of more than 120 persons interested in buying the, com uh, the product and testing it. We're not just building a community, we're also in contact with brands and media, for example, with Struer, that's a street advertisement company. We are also with a strong relationship with a journalist in Den Kölner Stadt Anzeige, where we already have our two articles published, and we're building partnerships with other startups, like, for example, Raisin, that they make uh, clothing apparel. So, how are we going to make it then? And this year, at the end of the year, we're launching our online store where the pre-orders will be available. And then we're starting with our crowdfunding campaign for the first units that will be produced in January 2023. Then, at the end of the year, we're expecting to sell more than 6,000 uh, units. And for 2025, we'll be entering our, the international market that will be the rest of Europe and North America. Yeah, and since we are industrial designer and mechanical engineer, and soon we are getting both product master and product design, uh, we are able to develop this product finally until end of this year. And so we are able to go on the market uh, beginning of next year. We also want to grow our company and add some marketing and accounting capabilities to scale it up soon. Yeah, and when you uh, want, want to know what's going on with ClipClap in the next time, please follow us on Instagram or just subscribe on your website on our website when you buy want to buy the product as an early bird. Thanks Thank for your you. attention. All right. Thank you very much for this pitch. Um, yeah, very cool that you brought your prototypes. And, and now we'll start with the jury Q&A, and this time the first question comes from Irene. Yes, I love the name, Clip Clap, so that, well done for that. Uh, I cycle, but I'm not such a serious cyclist that I would probably ever have used that product. So the obvious question, which might not have occurred to you, is what do I need it for? It seems to be very specific, more, let's say, racing bike, mountain bike, uh, interested community. So uh, first question, what do we really need it for? Why do we need this strap-on product? And secondarily, who really within the cycling community is your target customer? It's a smaller percentage of the market, right? Uh, well, it's not a small percentage of the market. Our product is uh, mainly aimed for uh, long, um, longer rides for the sun. What, for what, cycling. Does it, what does it do? For example, you can attach your foot uh, to the pedal and it increases up to 30% uh, the, the ability. Please and don't then you fall can off. rotate out and then you are... You are detached. You're, so, and so you're attached to the bicycle. The experience from driving it comes alone. Up, and if the I control... fall over, it's not going to be dangerous. So. No, no, you can just, it's like skiing. When you make an accident with skiing, then it falls from your feet. And this okay. is like, you, you can just So it's go more out. efficient. So it's really important for you to have benefits on that in terms of, you know, why do we need it? What's the benefit? But I would still argue, I don't know, um, quick audience uh, research. How many of you have ever used something like that? Okay, so not bad in this community. <laughs> yeah, actually, 10% 10, 10 of our market are clip pedal users in Germany. And yeah, we estimated like that maybe 2.5 of the, of the whole market will buy our product or are interested, which is like a really realistic uh, estimation, I would say. Yeah. And this is our revenue from 22 million euros just in Germany. This is the just realistic. Uh, really adjusted to that beachhead market within yes. the cycling community who are yes. serious buyers of this product. And okay. also we, we want to, to get the people which are not into cycling because from now on you don't need these shoes. You can just take your sneaker or every other shoe and put it on and go for work, just 10 kilometers, put it in your bag. And yeah, you don't need a special bag for that. Right. Next question from Bjorn. We're at two yeah. minutes. I have, 15. I have a similar question actually related to this. I mean, I know where to use it, but I'm, I mean, if you go to work in a normal distance, in regular distance, you don't need this because you have a normal city bike. Assuming that you go a longer distance, you know what you did, for example, to test your own product. I mean, you have special clothes on and probably you will also sweat a lot or if it's cold, you need special protection, etc., etc. I mean, anyhow, you would need some kind of changing before and after. So I'm really wondering how attractive is it to use it because you only use it in a certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's not a day-to-day -day product because if I'm going to work by bike, I'm taking a regular bike. I don't need it. If I want to go for exercising with a bike, 
I anyhow need to shower afterwards and change clothes, etc. So why not only change the shoes as well? But that's the thing. When you're when you're traveling, most of the time you just have like the two bags on the on the bags on the back, or you only have like the um, bags that are attached to your uh, thing. So space is valuable. It's precious. You don't want to take your biking shoes plus your other biking shoes plus the sandals. So it's like there's a lot of people that would love to go with these shoes, but at the end they don't want to be three months just with these cycling shoes. They decide to take um, sneakers, but then they, it's longer and it's um, stranded. Yeah, so. and to point this out, for, so in my case, I just have one pair of shoes and I use the shoes for cycling on the day and in the evening I use it also, like or when I go hiking or something or shopping. But if you go to work, it's really nice to have for like a, just a 10 kilometer trip, you can use this click pedals actually, because it's so easy. It's like five seconds, you put it on, you put it off, and then you can go with, like with your shoes you have on now, you can use it also, and it don't uh, scratch your shoes or something. And this is like a new opportunity for users which are not into click pedals now, but they could use it from now on, like an everyday use. This is the, the purpose. All right, we have around one minute left for the Drew Q&A, so one question from you and um, Quick. then we'll uh, so, so you mentioned about out of 13 million, 2.5% you may be able to capitalize, mm -hmm. okay? And then you said 10% of those 13 million are users of these kinds of uh, products. So what's your rationale for that 2.5%? Why this 2.5%? We conducted a self, um, we made a self-conducted survey, and then obviously it's um, with uh, almost 400 uh, participants, so we didn't want to just, we had the 83% interested, and that's obviously not related to the 13 million, and that's why it's relative conservative. Yeah, this was our estimation from the self-conducted survey, also like our market price, which what they answered and what the, the yeah. Got it. Uh, quick question. What's the patent? So what's the patent we on? We have the, the patent where we are already registered. We have the copyright use. And then uh, we're doing it, the extension for the PCT. And, but we're protected since May okay. 2020. But do, do you mean the content of the patent? What does it cover? But I yeah, think it's like you, don't, you can't make a base plate where you can attach these cleats. This black one is the cleat. And put it on, like make a belt on it and put it on your shoes. Like this is the main... Uh, main approach of this uh, pattern, but we have 35 other like reflective material spikes. So we have everything what's in our product Paragraph. now, we have protected from this point on. And not only with Velcro, but also with a cross system and uh, yeah. yeah like, like different types of attaching and stuff. And maybe there are some things we don't need, but we protect everything. Yeah. All right. Um, now we want to also give the audience a chance to ask the question. So first off, let's um, go to Alex, um, you want to take it ahead? One of our mentors here today. Yeah, hi there. Is there an opportunity to convert current non click bell users to uh, using your uh, device? Do you mean flat, like normal flat pedals? Correct. Uh, no, not yet. But uh, we were thinking about a solution maybe to make an adapter for this one. But actually, you have to buy like a click pedal, but they are also existing. This is the combi pedal you can use on this side. You can just use normal shoes without click pedals, and then you turn it, and then you have like this attachment where you can put the click shoes in or you can put the clip clip in. All right, we do have other questions from the audience. And um, let's see. Um, I see the young man in the white shirt back there. Um, Uh, I'm not sure if I catch the right price. What are you selling it for, and what is the competition offering? For well, the price? Is it, what is 38 or something? No, our selling price is 68 euros, okay. and well, the direct competition are we could say it's those like for example the Adidas shoes. There yeah. are 120. There are other um, variables from uh, 510, but they're also 120, and uh, the sandals are also 120 or 30. They're from Shimano. Thank you. And uh, to make this clear, we don't have any direct competition. We just have similar products which have, which have not these advantages we have right now. All right. And um, then let's go to the next question back there. Um, last behind you, there's a hand raised. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I really like your product. I used uh, these clap pedals once and it, it felt really uncomfortable to, to be in these shoes, so I would highly appreciate to use that. 
Um, on the other hand side, I'm curious because you emphasized the uh, sustainability of using worn out tires there. Um, do you have, like, what is your supply there? Do you have a uh, junkyard that you cooperate with or where do you find the materials? Well, at the moment, and that we are also using it as building up our community, we are uh, part of uh, several cycling groups. So I just posted them among the cyclists, and then uh, we're going to contact or we're contacting also um, Farad um, cycling shops to get all the um, ones that are punctured and uh, not working anymore. So that's also a plan to expand our community. All right, we have uh, time for around one more question. I know Helge, do you have another question? Um, okay, Helge has another question. So Lars, could you please um, give Helge the, the microphone? Yeah, thanks to the little pitch. Um, uh, I still uh, don't get it. It's, um, it's easy to get off, it's easy to get on. But when, when you get off, where you put it? You, you bring it with the back because it's, it's filthy, it's it was on the floor, so there has to become some kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah, we're still in that development process, and uh, we're going to do it in a little bag where you can carry it, or you can also just hang right. it there. <laughs> so if you if you have it outside, it's not a good solution, but we have like also a carabiner where you can put it like here, or you maybe when you have a backpack, you can put it in your backpack, but otherwise if you have the shoes, the backpack is full. And so you can put it like in the small back of the backpack and then you have enough space for different other things. May I have a short second? Um, and uh, to my knowledge is when you have the cyclist, they put the shoots on because they can push with one foot down and, and pull with the other up. So you can uh, you have a the strength. Stroke. Um, so, um, and, and with this, you get this eff effect as well, 100% or it's just like, is there an effect that it will never be used at the Tour de France? It, I, I think it, it would be never set? used at the Tour de France because the special shoes are a but little the, bit... But the effect will be the same, that the you pull as well yeah. and you, you get this 30% of energy, yeah. uh, whatever. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, and now the time is up. Thank you very much um, for Thanks. your pitch. Thank um, you. And <laughs> And make a like a short test ride later on with the All bike. Right. <laughs> thank you very much. And also thank you for bringing the bike. And um, now we come to our last pitch before the break, which is going to be done by Sport Sharing Network. Sport Sharing Network. Here's the clicker. And with this, you go to the next site. And um, you also have five minutes, which will be starting now. Hi, I'm Rufima. <laughs> and... Um, I'm normally a junior girls soccer coach for FC Nuremberg, but I like all kinds of sports, and that's why I joined Maru with Sportsharing Network. Sportsharing Network is an existing home sharing platform that works similar to Airbnb, but is for athletes, and I take care of um, marketing, and Mario was the founder. Yeah, I founded it because I have a background as a professional cyclist, and I've been traveling a lot, 250 days a year, and I experienced quite some pain points um, when traveling with my bike, uh, with one being that the right equipment was missing, like a proper pump or the tools. And also I had no real local knowledge, so it might have happened that we went out for a ride and ended up on uh, the autobahn or the highway. Um, and then of team and I started my first business in 2018, Velo Villa, and offered a solution to those problems. It's a house in Spain that we equipped with everything a cyclist can only wish for. And it's always fully booked in winter. Actually, right now we have some guests. And, um, and in summer, we just rent it to normal tourists. So we have no real seasonality, which is quite rare in places like Spain. In winter, it's actually always empty. But you can not just buy more and more houses. So there was a scalability problem, which I thought could be solved with an online platform. And that's why I created a spot sharing network. Um, that's how the scalable solution looks like. Um, here you can see the, uh, it's a screenshot of the page. Uh, you can see the filters, the, the sport specific road cycling filters that you can expect in this uh, particular accommodation. And also we connect athletes so you don't end up on the highway um, in two ways. One is you can live directly with another athlete at home. So uh, you benefit of this guy's uh, infrastructure and also he can give advice for routes. Uh, but also we have a very new feature just implemented this week um, that we share also groups, training groups. Um, so, if, for example, if you are in Bremen for some kind of uh, pitch event, you could just join the local cycling group uh, tomorrow before the flight home and train with them. 
and so you have always the nice routes to to go obviously such a platform consists not only of guests but also of hosts and we um, offer a solution to a lot of problems for them too um, when uh, the sh share with another athlete option is used it's much more personal you have the same passion for the sport you can talk about then athletes are supposedly the better guests because you know they just train uh, eat sleep repeat and don't have time for much parties are just tired and um, yeah the guests we had in summer we always have issues because you know uh, something's always destroyed in in, in uh, one season and the mentioned seasonal occupancy is um, fought with a new target group of athletes and we make money a uh, normal um, platform business we take 7.5 percent of the whole 7.5 percent of the guests we have to pay some taxes and credit card fees so we end up with 9.6 percent net profit of each transaction so now about the demand and market. So we found this of the Sport Event and Tourism Association from the USA in 2019. It generated 69 million room nights for spectators or participants of sport events. And the market is even bigger because this is only the USA and only the big sport events. And the current situation, our website is up and running, so you could book an accommodation. We got 150 members, 50 accommodations in nine countries, and mainly cycling disciplines, as you can see on the right. So road cycling, mountain biking, bike packing. And the marketing, so there's um, an option how we want to reach our target group, the referral link. So if, for example, Björn would share a link to our website to Irene, um, Björn would get 10% of Irene's first booking. Yeah, then we have uh, this training, group, training groups I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, also, we have access to them. And, and uh, my idea is if there is, for example, the Bremen Marathon uh, coming up in eight weeks, I will let know all the um, running groups in Bremen that uh, many runners might need an accommodation in eight weeks and ask them um, to share their guest room with the fellow runners. And um, this is these are our future ideas. We want to be available worldwide. Now it's only uh, euros. Um, we want to add more sports, uh, sport hotels, and then also share uh, more than just accommodation, namely equipment. And that's also where we actually would invest uh, this price in. And um, yeah, in the end, we want to be a real digital transformator for the whole sport. Yeah, and we also want to be an app. Also add an app. And now, thanks for your time. If you want, you can scan this barcode and get redirected to the website. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. And uh, now we'll come to the last Q&A session um, before the break. So uh, first off, we'll take it to the jury. Um, Helga, do you want to start this time? He <laughs> Could we let Helga start? <laughs> OK, Bjorn, you go. Just a quick question, basically. I mean. I really like the idea. I'm just questioning if I would be Airbnb and I would get aware about this. I would say like, okay, hosts implement this as well. And I would even approach your hosts and say like, you know, I give it you for free for the next two years because they have the money to do that. So they could simply basically approach your host, basically copy the idea. What do you do against this? You mean Airbnb would uh, approach our hosts? You as a host, you own an apartment, you know, and rent it on your platform. I as Airbnb send you an email and say like, hey, put it on my platform as well. We have implemented this section for sports sectors as well. I give it you for free for the next two years because they have the money to do that. I mean, you, you say Airbnb would uh, cancel their, their, uh, their fees for, for those users. If you rent the apartment out for the sports things, you know, not on the regular renting out, but for the sports things, then actually in this case, you can do it for free for the next two years. You know, we just charging one person but not yeah, close. and I, I get what you mean. Um, many people ask me this was why wouldn't Airbnb just uh, copy our system? And it's because I think because my my background as a professional cyclist, I, I understand the sport very, very deep and also the, the host side of things because of um, Vilo Villa. And I think it's not just copyable. Um, for example, uh, this, this group ride sharing thing. This is something that can't just be copied. You need to be deep inside the sport to um, make it happen once, and um, once I, I'm, I achieved it in road cycling, I can uh, show it to mountain bikers and runners, for example, and then they can copy it. But that's something that would make it really difficult for Airbnb to copy us. Yeah, and um, 
also uh, this is how we want to connect athletes so airbnb is more for like you can go to a city and there you can live and but we really want to connect and also um we are um as mario mentioned um working with um the big sport events so that um, the participants can live um, in our accommodations and um, yeah so like cycling events yeah we actually have some events that uh, confirmed they would let the participants know about us if we make uh, make it to uh, get enough accommodations in the area all right um we have around two and a half minutes left for the q a so let's carry on with the next question um yeah uh to to get the difference between uh, airbnb and you um you target a specific community yes. um but this community as a cyclist um to my knowledge is a quite wealthy community um and uh i, I see probably a, a tiny problem because uh do they want to really charge for letting another athlete maybe i'm going tomorrow with the marathon to getting paid from you know what i mean isn't it just like community driven he can stay over in my apartment for free I mean, people can charge as much as they want. If they want to charge only a euro, it's up to them. Uh, but I think it's a nice way, especially for those events. You know, they are not cheap. If you want to participate in a premium marathon, I don't know the exact price, but it's not uncommon that it's 100 euros. And by accommodating someone, uh, you might, you know, decrease th this fee a little bit you know, okay. ahead of the event. It's just because you're, you're taking a percentage. And, and I can imagine when, when I'm a, a cyclist, and yet there's coming another cyclist, I, I would let, uh, get, let, him let, let him have my guest room for free. So it's just like you eat with him, you share the, the stuff. Yeah, I totally, just, I totally just put in that. mind when you take a percentage, then you maybe lose some customers because some of them won't want to do it for free. So what would your uh, business model look like? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is a very interesting I question. Tell you later on. <laughs> um, but let's carry on to the next question since we only have about a minute left for the jury Q and A. Um, so Roger, please uh, take it ahead. I was just looking through the side and I see mountain biking, road cycling, bike, uh, bike, bike packing, tennis, triathlon. So it's a bit unclear as of uh, being in the early stage. What's your go-to market in a customer segment? The first sets of people that you're going to win your hearts over. Who are they? Uh, Probably road cyclists because I'm familiar in the sport and people also know me. And if I approach them and say, hey, I have this new website, um, do, don't you want to have a look at it? Um, so I think those are the yeah, main customers, also the customers of Velo Villa, you know, they, they come to us, but they could also use different houses. And um, in terms of uh, hosts, which is also important, um, we, we approach like... Um, property managers in, in Spain, for example, who take care of other people's uh, holiday homes. And, you know, some of them have more than 200 uh, accommodation. And if we convince one of them, we have uh, maybe 100 accommodations okay. in, at once. So. Anyway, right. your Airbnb for, let's say, let's say in this case, uh, some, some form of athletes, then I think my next question is like, What's your strategy for, uh, for, let's say, Airbnb in this scenario can just put in a filter, which would be somebody who has a passion for this and that sports, right? All it takes is to put that filter. Yeah. So what's your game plan uh, in that response, right? Because we've seen that happen with Snapchat, Facebook, all, the, all those sort of, because the, the companies become the features into a bigger companies, right? So what's your approach here? And I feel the community aspect is missing here. What's your plan here? Yeah, exactly. In Airbnb, the community aspect is missing, and that's what our main focus is to get um, to get users. Of course, Airbnb could um, send out a message to all its hosts, but they are not into the sport really. They are uh, just regular people. Some of them might be cyclists, but um, you know, with us, it's all cyclists. And sometimes it's only the very small things um, that make a big difference. Like I said, uh, having a big pump. Would make uh, would make a big difference. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're already into the time of the audience Q and A. So, are there any questions from the audience? I see a raised hand right there. So, please take it ahead. Hi, um, I'm not a cyclist, but I play in the amateur football league in Switzerland. So, I was really curious about um, referring to Bjorn's initial question about the Airbnb. Um, I. 
so so to me if i understand you correctly i should uh, use your platform for the sake of that we have something in common regarding sports this is this was my observation i'm not sure if i understand your uh, yeah, model yeah you you got it right um okay the benefit of uh choosing us is that your host uh could talk to you about football, about the latest Champions League, about the okay. latest Swiss League game or whatever. Okay. And you could even go uh, playing football together. Okay, now imagine the following situation. Airbnb goes to the FC Basel, for example, and says like, make an advertising for my, um, you know, for my platform. And then, you know, for me as a fan example, I would rather t tend to go there because I, I have s some, you know, um, connection to, to a football club, for example. Um, did you consider also in your business model, like in, in, in your case, cyclists to also uh, win over other cyclists, uh, famous cyclists to actually um, act as a brand ambassador? It's funny that you say, uh, but I founded my own team this year and yeah. one of the sponsors is uh, Sport Sharing Network. <laughs> cool, yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, we will be riding also internationally and the brand will be shown. Of course, it's not FC Basel, it's, uh, yeah. it's an amateur team, but it's a start. But we could go to FC Basel somewhere yeah. at, some, at some time. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, I see we have another question back in the audience and that is Andy, please go ahead. I have a question about your scalability. You mentioned that you're targeting professional athletes, but in the majority of sports, they operate under sporting federations or clubs that take care of the logistics for the athletes. So are these like conventional like sporting federations, are they your rival or are they potential customer that you could? Uh, no, I think, I think you got it wrong. Um, it's, we don't target professional cyclists. We target all kinds of cyclists, you know, everyone who just started during COVID and also uh, the, the ta target audience of uh, Clip Lab is also actually our target audience. Yeah, and also bikepacking is like a trend so that people um, travel with their bike and explore different cities. And like, um, like Yannick did, he um, traveled with his bike from um, Cologne to Portugal. And it's a trend, so is, this is also our target group. Okay, I think we have one more question. <laughs> okay, then make it please really quick. We only have around 30 seconds left. Okay, so I just want to know what's your product advantage compared to, I don't know, some Facebook groups as warm showers for cyclists that you can just post there and yeah. Yeah, um, we centralize all those groups. So uh, our, our training group ride sharing is you click on, let's say, Bremen cycling groups and then you see the group and you see the Facebook group, the Strava group, the WhatsApp group and you can just join any and it's they have to end. say which one is their most commonly used. Yeah, and um, if we um, last sentence, please. Yeah, if we Thank have you. an app in the future, maybe we could also do an app tracking. So um, there you are. So All you're right. Thank you very much for your pitch and also for the numerous questions from everyone. Thank you very much, guys. Um, after these five pitches, um, we will take a 15 minute break. So please be back um, from the foyer in 50 minutes so we can continue on time. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for the pitches and we'll see you back. <laughs>